So for our uh, next talk, we already got a little bit of a sneak peek and uh, really doesn't need much of an introduction. Dr. Stanley Roxon is the Chief of Consultative Cardiology and Alan Tina Neal Professor of Lymphatic Research and Medicine uh, and Professor of Medicine at Stanford University. So we'll bring up his talk. Uh, again, doesn't really need much of an introduction beyond that. Really, a, uh, we'll be on the Mount Rushmore of lymphedema if and when that's, that's made. So looking forward to his discussion. Good morning. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers for the opportunity to speak to you today. And I thank you all for your attention. Uh, my privilege is to talk to you about anti-inflammatory therapy for lymphedema. This is a research and clinical topic that has been an active part of my activities for at least the last 18 years. And I'm happy to say that the work proceeds very favorably and I hope will, will soon represent a true alternative for lymphedema treatment. The specific problem that I'm interested in is the biology of lymphedema that causes it to transition from this early stage of clearly pitting edema to the latter stages and the most common stages of lymphedema where this pitting quality is gradually and eventually completely lost, leaving us with an enlarged, rigid, and non-distensible form of volume excess in the limb that represents a significant treatment challenge. We have great therapeutic interventions for the hydrostatic pitting component of the lymphedema, but once we uh, get to this stage of skin thickening and adipose hypertrophy and uh, fibrosis, it becomes very, very difficult uh, to provide uh, therapeutic interventions that are successful. Uh, when I entered into this arena, there was very little understood about the biology of this transformation from pitting to non-pitting edema. And for that reason, uh, I developed and uh, modulated uh, a model to study lymphedema in the rodent using the mouse tail as a surrogate for the lymphedematous arm. Uh, in the mouse tail, there are two lymphatic channels on either side of the tail, and these can be ablated to create a subacute form of edema that we've shown has closely that we have shown that it closely simulates the presentation of stages of lymphedema with very tight correlation to uh, human aspects of the disease. The um, the tail model has the benefit of being a rapid throughput system that allows us to study not only volume responses, but also the histology of the tissues. And in addition, we developed a digital photographic method that allows us to very accurately uh, estimate the volume of the tail and changes in the volume of the tail uh, based upon therapeutic interventions. Our initial attempt was to try to define the biology by actually looking at the tissues that are uh, affected by the lymphedema. The end organ response to lymphedema is in the skin and in the subcutaneous tissues, and we could harvest those tissues and at that a point in time perform what was the state-of-the-art method of looking at whole genome uh, transcriptional uh, profiling, and uh, we did this by microarray. And what we were very surprised to find at that uh, era in uh, lymphatic biology was the extraordinarily strong uh, um, inflammatory uh, substrate of the lymphedema presentation. So that when we looked at lymphedema skin in the mouse and compared it uh, to the skin of surgical shams, we found that most of the transformation in the transcriptional message within the harvested tissues was in aspects of inflammation and the immune response. And this allowed us to elaborate a hypothetical uh, framework in which we think chronic inflammation plays a central role in uh, modulating the relationship between lymphatic dysfunction, interstitial edema, and immune dysfunction, and ultimately leading to the fibrosis, adipose deposition, and hypercellularity of the chronic lymphedema disease state. Based on our 
initial observations and on some of the uh, components of the inflammatory response uh, that we observed by transcriptional profiling, we decided to resort to uh, a semi-empiric therapy with um, a, a, an anti-inflammatory agent that has very unique attributes. The drug we were looking at is called ketoprofen. It is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, and this means that it does inhibit the cyclooxygenase pathway that leads to the production of inflammatory uh, prostanoids like thromboxane. But in addition, ketoprofen is a unique non-steroidal anti-inflammatory in that it simultaneously uh, inhibits the lipoxygenase pathway or 5-LO pathway. Uh, and in our initial transcriptional profiling, we did find that 5-LO was uh, an upregulated uh, modulator that was seen in the lymphedematous skin. Utilizing this approach of systemic therapy with ketoprofen, we found that in as little as two weeks, we could transform the um, very abnormal histology that you see here in untreated lymphedema with tremendous thickening of the dermis, um, dilation of lymphatic channels, and a, and a relatively profound inflammatory infiltrate into this picture in which um, the skin is uh, fundamentally normal. We also found that in our use of ketoprofen in the animal model, in the mouse model, uh, we would um, see in the untreated state these large lymphedematous channels, almost like lakes of lymph that uh, become dilated in the skin. In the normal skin, uh, we almost cannot uh, see the lymphatic channels because in normal skin, there is very little uh, residual lymph within uh, the channels in resting conditions. And what we saw with ketoprofen therapy is that we could revert this lymphatic dilation to a more normal picture, uh, which we considered to be positive uh, microvascular remodeling and uh, a surrogate for um, the, uh, the therapeutic response. So here you see actually the distinction between normal lymphedema skin untreated lymphedema, and then the reversion to a state in which almost all of the inflammation is resolved. The dermal thickening uh, has resorted to near normal, and we see uh, virtually no lymphatic uh, dilations. And this was all accompanied, of course, by a very dramatic reduction in, uh, in mouse tail volume to near normal uh, levels. So we were quite excited about the whole uh, inflammatory cascade and its relationship to the uh, aspects of lymphedema that at that stage uh, were considered to be irreversible. We next uh, decided to turn our attention, of course, to the human condition. And we started by attempting uh, to use a very similar strategy of looking at uh, the skin expression profile in order to determine what appropriate uh, uh, biomarkers might be uh, to help us to track the presence or absence of lymphedema and perhaps its response to treatment. And what we found when we sampled uh, paired um, uh, specimens of skin from patients with uh, lymphedema with an unaffected and affected limb and compared the profile between those two limbs, we found again a tremendous increase in the inflammatory and immune signaling in the lymphedematous uh, skin, which uh, closely correlated with what we observed in the mouse. There were other aspects as well, of course, and very important to the biology of lymphedema, but these were the ones that we were quite uh, focused upon in terms of our uh, subsequent work. As we um, collected uh, plasma samples from these same individuals, um, we were able then, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not from the same individuals, but from a second cohort of individuals, we were able to identify that with as little as six biomarkers obtained from those specimens, we were able to uh, clearly distinguish the lymphedematous state from normal controls with an area under the curve that predicted 90% or close to 90% specificity and sensitivity. And you'll notice once again that there was a tremendous um, 
uh, presence of the inflammatory component. These various biomarkers were not chosen by design, but actually emerged from a logistical regression approach. And of course, it's quite gratifying to find that among the six, um, three of these agents are actually associated with the inflammatory process, as well as other processes associated with lymphedema. Based upon all of these observations, we next decided to extend our murine observations uh, to the human uh, lymphedema condition. And this um, uh, positive pilot clinical trial was published in JCI Insight uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, basically, we decided on the basis of what we observed uh, histologically in the mouse to look at skin thickness as the primary endpoint for the responsiveness uh, of the lymphedema. Now, of course, when we abrogate inflammation, we are abrogating one of the ongoing drivers of hydrostatic edema, because of course, a fluid edema is a component of the inflammatory process. But in this case, we feel that the most direct target that has reversibility uh, along with the edema is in fact the changes in the skin. What we were able to observe, and this is an example Example of one of the enrolled patients who received the active drug, um, you can see that at baseline, the minimal thickness that can be subtended with a caliper is about 35 millimeters. And once we um, expose the patient to oral systemic therapy for six months, that lymphedema thickness uh, of the skin reverts to basically normal. Uh, so this is about three to millimeters, perhaps four millimeters, and normal uh, in the contralateral arm would have been perhaps one or two. So nearly normal, a very, a very um, a beneficial and uh, dramatic clinical response to the oral therapy. We also sampled skin from these patients and we created an empiric histopathological score that encompassed all of the attributes that we saw in a training set of untreated lymphedema. And again, we saw a dramatic uh, re reversion to normal, including surprisingly to me, reversibility of the collagen component that was seen in the skin. So this suggests that even the fibrotic response to the lymphedema can be reversed uh, to a degree. We also specifically demonstrated, and not surprisingly, that ketoprofen did uh, decrease 5-LO expression in the skin. This is the pharmacologic uh, response that we uh, expected. Uh, based on this set of observations, we decided to return to the bench and understand, try to understand to what degree the response to ketoprofen was based upon inhibition of 5-LO versus inhibition of the cyclooxygenase component, because remember, this is a dual anti-inflammatory agent. So once again, at this stage, we're trying to understand, is it this aspect of the cascade or this aspect of the cascade or both that are, is responsible for the beneficial therapeutic response. And what we ultimately determined is indeed it is the 5-LO component and specifically an agent downstream from 5-LO, uh, which is uh, called LTB4 or leukotriene B4. So let me just show you some of the observations we made again in, in the mouse model and some were also made in, um, in cell culture of human lymphatic endothelial cells. Here you see what amounts to a normal lymphocytogram in the mouse tail with clearly delineated uh, channels by fluorescein um, lymphangiography uh, indicating normal uh, lymphatic transit through the tail. In untreated lymphedema, we lose all of the functional architecture of the lymphatics, and you see this very profound uh, um, surrogate for dermal backflow, or basically what is dermal backflow. In as little as one week after exposure to a specific LTB4 antagonist, we see almost complete resolution of the lymphatic functional architecture. And this was the only intervention in the mouse. There was no other um, attempt to correct the lymphedema. So this was basically reversal of the LTB4 effect on the lymphatic uh, architecture and function. I just want to show you briefly the fact that um, that restoration at the, the level of the skin results in restoration of proximal flow 
uh, through lymphatic channels. So here you have the surgical site, uh, and what you will observe momentarily is that we actually return lymphatic flow uh, into the proximal collecting channels. This is the direction toward the body of the mouse. I won't take the time to show you the control situation, but suffice it to say, we see no cross of the material by near-infrared lymphatic imaging from the section distal to the surgical site uh, to the part of the tail that takes uh, the lymph flow back to the body. Now, what we determined in all of this work is that if we use uh, an agent like ketoprofen that blocks 5-LO, or if we use specific LTB4 antagonists, we can reverse uh, the tail architecture and uh, lymphedema to normal. But if we simply use a cyclooxygenase inhibitor like ibuprofen, this, this uh, effect does not occur. And in fact, in many cases, the lymphedema gets worse. So uh, this is a summary of a very broad uh, scale of pharmacologic interventions. And we found basically that uh, what I just said, LTB4 antagonism is effective, 5-LO antagonism is effective, but if we try to block either cyclooxygenase or the other pathways downstream of 5-LO like LTC4 antagonists, Silutan and, and Montelukast, we have no therapeutic effect. We also uh, demonstrated that in the mice, as well as in human uh, uh, plasma samples, there is a dramatic elevation of LTB4 levels that are circulating within the blood, uh, again, showing the close, co close correlation between the mouse model and the human model, and encouraging us to look for LTB4 antagonists that would be useful in human lymphedema. Uh, so to summarize, we decided that, in fact, cyclooxygenase was not playing a role in this therapeutic effect. It may play an indirect supporting role uh, insofar as um, there is a downstream uh, metabolite of uh, cyclooxygenase, which is um, uh, which is pro-lymphangiogenic. And so uh, if we were able to uh, undertake 5-LO antagonism or LTB4 antagonism directly without the cyclooxygenase component, we might actually see a more profound uh, therapeutic effect, which is actually part of uh, the strategy uh, in what followed. So LTB4 became our target. LTB4 is a very potent um, mediator of inflammation that plays a role not only in our work in lymphedema, but in a broad array of uh, pathologies. And in fact, some of this may actually play a role in lymphedema as well. Specifically, its role in obesity may help to explain some of the adipose hypertrophy aspect of lymphedema that we see in the disease of our interest. So based upon this work, we did uh, initially launch a placebo-controlled trial of lymphedema in the leg. Uh, unfortunately, this study was underpowered and was terminated prior to the point that we could uh, achieve um, a, an appropriate statistical analysis of the primary endpoint. We enrolled about 50 patients in this study, and we needed about 250 patients to draw the conclusions that we were looking for. So uh, unfortunately, I have a lot of unanswered questions about this clinical trial, but I do want to tantalize you with one final set of images. This was the last patient who was enrolled uh, in this clinical trial. This patient did uh, receive active uh, drug therapy. Uh, she had uh, lymphedema of um, the, uh, one of the lower extremities based upon prior gynecologic malignancy and treatment. Um, the lymphedema was so severe that she had to leave her uh, prior position as a critical care nurse because she could not um, uh, carry through with prolonged standing and 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 uh, ambulation. She received the LTB4 antagonist for six months by oral therapy. And then um, thereafter, the trial was concluded. 18 months after she completed the trial, she sent me a picture of her legs, uh, which had, of course, reverted to uh, basically normal by the end of the trial, but remained so despite any uh, uh, further uh, pharmacologic therapy. She continues to wear a low-grade uh, compression stocking, and that is her sole lymphedema uh, support. Um, she has been able to go back to school and get a graduate degree and has returned, or returned to critical care nursing. So I think that this uh, very very um, uh, um, single observation um, is compelling, and it compels me to move forward 
With the work, I'm happy to announce that we have identified a new and even more targeted LTB4 antagonist uh, that we will be um, utilizing in further clinical trials. We plan to launch this as a single center site uh, in January of 2022 at Stanford, and it will be a trial of upper extremity lymphedema. So I'm certainly happy to speak to any patients or clinicians who have uh, patients who might be interested in uh, being enrolled in this uh, open label clinical trial that will have a nine month duration. It will require multiple visits to the Stanford site, uh, but if that is feasible, we are happy to entertain anyone who would like to be involved in the trial. I'd like to conclude by saying that on a therapeutic basis, I believe anything is possible. I believe pharmacologic therapy has a dramatic uh, future role uh, for uh, the approach to, uh, to this problem. And uh, I look forward to a bright future uh, for our patients where we can eventually conquer and perhaps even uh, prevent this disease. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy mm -hmm. to answer any questions. Excellent, thanks so much, Dr. Roxon. As always a phenomenal discussion, particularly on this pathway. So we have, we're gonna start with just one question from the audience and then we're gonna move down uh, the other moderators. Um, there's a question regarding you know, uh, patient selection in the anti-inflammatory therapy. Are there any that you would you know, certainly want to avoid for potential side effects, um, say for ketoprofen or others? Right. Well, so um, much to uh, my fortune, um, the FDA didn't release its black box warning on non-steroidal anti-inflammatories until 2015, at which point we had enrolled all of our subjects and, and, and studied them. Uh, but uh, since that time, it has become clear that NSAIDs do carry a significant potential cardiovascular risk, among others, that the conventional ones we've always known, renal function and bleeding. But we now uh, would heavily screen patients for high risk for uh, subclinical atherosclerotic uh, or hypertensive uh, complications and or anybody who has overt uh, problems in that area. Uh, so so that, that represents a significant concern with the ketoprofen. And one reason that I'm so interested in exploring the LTB4 antagonists is that they lack all of that concern over comorbidities and the likelihood of making other medical problems worse. So as far as we know, these LTB4 antagonists have very minor uh, side effect potential and, and nothing that looms on the horizon as a, uh, you know, as a, as, as a monster in the closet that's going to, to going to limit our ability to treat. So uh, we have no significant exclusion criteria for our upcoming trial other than the usual absence of severe comorbidities or age-related uh, issues or uh, those related to the patient's ability to uh, give co informed consent. Great, excellent. And Dr. Padera, you have a question? Yeah, well, and I guess there's one question from the audience that just sort of a follow-up if, if in the ultra trial there were observed side effects that you could comment on. Nothing, nothing substantive. No, we had, we had nobody that had to be removed from the study because of adverse uh, symptomatology. There were no uh, adverse events that we documented. Uh, really, the problem with that study was just um, a, 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 a ridiculously limited budget that did not allow us to get to what we would need to accomplish in order to provide a statistical analysis. So, so the, the point to be made here is that the when we unblinded everybody, the, the treated patients got better, but so did enough of the placebo patients as we see in placebo controlled trials that we couldn't do a valid statistical analysis. And thank you for your, your beautiful presentation. I always enjoy hearing some of the basic biology behind everything. And one of the questions that's always sort of struck me is, with the reduction in inflammation, is the reduction in inflammation inducing lymphatic regrowth and function, or does that have to be happening independent so that the reduction in inflammation then takes care of all the other changes associated with lymphedema as it develops? Well, um, it's a great question, Tim. And, and I think the answer is is the first of, of, of your um, uh, uh, situations. And I think it's based on what we observed in the cultured human lymphatic endothelial cells and in the bench work related to, uh, you know, to the mouse model, because what we found is that 
when LTD4 levels rise, it actually has an inhibitory uh, impact on VEGFR3 and also on notch signaling. And we, we decided that in fact, once this inflammatory cascade is activated, it probably limits the lymphatic regenerative response that can keep the unaffected at-risk patient in a latent stage of disease. So what we think we're doing in essence is allowing enough lymphatic regeneration to restore latency. Um, but I think it is actually that the vasculature becomes more healthy with therapy. Great. And just one, one other thing that I, with your, um, your sort of uh, biomarkers, leptin came up. Yep. And I was wondering if you had any comments on leptin in particular as a biomarker and is it a functional biomarker or is it just something that's happening because of all the, uh, you know, uh, adipose tissue deposition? Well, I, I think it's a marker for the adipose component of the pathology. And, and, and what it says basically is that if you, if you, I think what it's saying is that if you look agnostically as a group, at a group of patients who have lymphedema and compare them to normal subjects, you're going to find leptin levels that are higher and it helps you to segregate. Now, obviously, if there are enough obese patients in your control group, it's going to, it's going to mitigate the power of that particular marker. But um, it obviously was, it was statistically very, very significant in this cohort that we looked at. Um, and I must admit our normal cohort wasn't particularly obese. It was, it was a relatively normal BMI among the normals. Um, but again, what I, as I said in, in the talk, those six biomarkers came out of the 60 or 70 that we looked at through simple logistical regression. So we made no attempt to say, gee, we're really interested in, you know, VEGFR3 or inter um, that wouldn't be a biomarker in the blood, but let's say we're interested in VEGFC or we're interested in, uh, in, in, in 5 lo or whatever it might be. We simply allowed the biomarker data to direct us to the ones that had the most power to differentiate the two groups. Well, thanks again, Dr. Roxon. Really always a pleasure to have you. And we look forward to your future talks with uh, hopefully some nice benefits for our patients. Thank you so much again for the invitation. Thank you.